as we go throughout the year, we're going to have summits where many of you are going to be invited back to begin to workshop through and to begin to brainstorm, not only dealing with the problem, but now bringing viable solutions. Thank you, Dr. Baby, for helping us to understand uh, the severity of just missing the day of school and what we can do to curb that. After we listened to Dr. Bailey, we were going to flow right into another problem, which is the school pipeline to prison. And that is a very serious issue in our community. And we'd asked someone who we felt had expertise to really share with us along that subject in the person of Diane Clement Boyd, Executive Director of the Human Relations Commission. Uh, but. Uh, she let me know on last night and then confirmed on this morning that her father uh, was taken to the hospital and uh, he's there now and therefore she won't be able to attend. And she, I asked for permission and she gave me permission for me to mention him by name, uh, Mr. Clements, and that we could come together and go to God in prayer yeah. in his behalf. Yeah. So I'm gonna ask you to bow with me right now uh, as we intercede uh, in his behalf. Our Father and our God in heaven, yes. we're so grateful for the opportunity to bow before you, uh, to intercede in behalf of Mr. Boyd, uh, Mr. Clemens, I'm sorry, Mr. Clemens. Yeah. We're praying to God for his recovery. We're praying for Diane as she ministers to her father. And that has taken her away from this assignment that she was looking forward to, uh, to eagerly participate in. But we understand, dear God, that um, she had a higher uh, job description on today. And that's to be there for her father. We acknowledge that and we commend her for that. And we lay that family up before you. <laughs> that you would intervene in that situation. That you would bring comfort and healing in that family. And, and whatever needs to be brought to bear, every resource, every physician, every diagnosis, yeah. uh, be brought to bear to bring out the favorable outcome. So we thank you for her and her heart uh, to be with us, but also, more importantly, to be there uh, for her father. And so, dear God, we're asking that you just hear our prayer and come alongside of that family. Bless them where they need to be blessed. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. This time we're going to ask for a young man by the name of uh, Montez Cooper to come. He has something he wants to share with us. elementary school. We've been there since our inception and we've had an opportunity to make some impressions as many roles and um, they thank us and we thank them. It's a collaboration. So I'm going to ask Mrs. Tolliver if you would please come and say a couple of words if you will uh, concerning your relationship and how much you love SEMA. <laughs> Ms. Tolliver.
last October, when I received a call, would I come take over Lincoln because the principal was leaving. So of course I prayed about it, talked to my family about it, and then decided I would come back. I retired in 2020. <laughs> but I retired to take care of my dad. I helped take care of my dad. And then my dad ended up passing three months after I retired. So I had that void in my life because I retired prematurely. I still had a lot to give. So anyway, I get emotional. But I um, agreed to come to Lincoln and my first week there, the men of Sigma came. Amen. They said, we are here. We are here to support you. You let us know what you need. And they have stood by that. They help in so many ways. Um, one way that they help is financially. They help support our students, field trips. They not only support financially, they will go along with us. And if anyone has ever been on a field trip with any kindergarten through eighth graders, they know that is a challenge. But they never say no. I had a vision when I started Lincoln that I wanted to do what I call a winter wonderland. Yeah. So I talked to Ted and James and a bunch of SEMA guys about it. And they said, okay, we can do that. So we transformed our gym to a winter wonderland. And they provided gifts for every student, either a gift they could unwrap or they gave the middle school students $25 gift cards. What a blessing. What a blessing. SEMA guys are in our building each and every day. Every day. We have three different grades that are there. That are there. Um, we have Mr. Graves, that's with our fourth grade. He was with third grade last year, and he moved with them to fourth grade. So he has built some very strong relationships with those students. Uh, we have Mr. Tony Garrett. He works in our art class. And when he is not there, the students are asking, where's our friend? We haven't <laughs> seen him this week. Where is he? He has built strong relationships with our students. We have Mr. Clemens here. He is in the cafeteria having conversations and just, just listening to students. If he doesn't show up, they are wondering, where is he? Mr. Ted has had some health challenges and he hasn't been there as much as he wants to be or we want him to be, but we definitely understand. <coughs> They're asking, where is Mr. Ted? Okay. Yeah. So we look forward to him coming back. He was there with us this year during our Winter Wonderland, and the kids were tickled pink to see him. Um, SEMA, I can't say enough about them. The mentorship, this, just the being there, the having conversations with our students, showing students that they care, implanting in students that they can be successful, they need to make the right choices. Um, it's just such a blessing. And I tell you, I committed to stay last year, another year, and it's because I'm not in this alone. I have support. And with that support, I can do all this. So I don't know if Dr. Smith knows, but I have in my heart, Agreed to stay one more year. <laughs> I can't promise anything about after that. Yes, we'll just take it. <laughs> we'll just take it one year at a time. But I tell you, part of my reasoning for staying is due to my relationships with the SEMA guys and the support that they give the students at Lincoln. Thank you. And Mr. Ted, I have a folder of thank you notes from the students of Lincoln who thank and appreciate you guys for all you do. Right now, you can kind of see where we're going with this thing. We went from 
uh, truancy, uh, talking about the pipeline to prison. Uh, well, Ms. Uh, Clemens Boyd was not here. But it's, it, it progresses into something else. The incarceration rate of black men and women, um, what well, is men and women, period, but black men and women is of epidemic proportion. We need to be able to stem the tide. We have someone here with us today, the person of uh, Pastor Stephen Brown, who works firsthand experience, has firsthand experience because he works in the correctional institution. He's boots on the ground where the rubber meets the road. And he is going to share with us some things that relates to uh, the penal system, uh, how the disproportionate you know, incarceration rate uh, adversely, in fact, impacting not only our homes, our streets, our children, uh, but people seem to have no hope. And when you lose hope, you lose everything. And so when people have no hope, but I don't think I'm gonna live that long, I don't have a problem taking you out. And so now we have uh, brothers killing brothers and uh, sisters killing sisters and uh, the streets have become uh, a jungle. And grandmothers are afraid of the grandkids. Uh, some grandmothers are, are prisoners in their own homes because of the rebellious attitude of the children. And so we need to be able to stop that. We need to be able to come together and become the solution to the problem. So we've asked Mr. Stephen Brown to come and talk to us about uh, that epidemic of prison incarceration. Stephen Brown, he's a prison and jail chaplain for the Vanderbilt County Jail in the city of Evansville, Indiana, a native of Evansville, Indiana. He attended Lincoln High School to 1962 and then graduated from North High School in 1964. He served in the U.S. Uh, Marine Corps and he retired from Alcoa after 40 years of service. He's a pastor of the Friendship Baptist Church and also serves on the Vandenberg County Sheriff's uh, Merit Board as well as the Wabash Valley Correctional Facilities Advisory Board. He is the husband of Mrs. Uh, Lily I. Moore Brown of uh, 54 years. We give a round of applause, Mr. Arnett. <laughs> this time we're going to ask uh, Pastor Brown if you come and speak to us about this epidemic um, crisis in our for allowing me the opportunity to share in this SEMA breakfast, fellowship breakfast, moving by faith. Also for allowing me to speak briefly this morning on a topic that I think I'm somewhat familiar with. Um, one that has become dear to my heart for the last 45 years. You've already been blessed by hearing a couple other speakers this morning. And I trust that what they said will be a great help and encouragement to you as we all go about trying to be difference makers, not only for these children, for this city, and for mankind as a whole. I'd like to share with you this morning some statistics from the Vandenberg County Detention Center, as you know, known as the Vandenberg County Jail. Uh, I've been privileged to work with seven sheriffs starting with Jim the group, uh, Jerry Rainey. Jerry Rainey was going out, Jim the group, Clarence Shepard, Ray Hamner, Brad Ellsworth, Dave Wedding, uh, and now Mr. Noah Robinson, Sheriff Robinson, who've been most gracious to the ministry for allowing us to come in and have that time with the inmates. Yeah. The African the American community is definitely uh, one that it has to have, has been touched deeply through crime, the cycle of crime. And there's a lot of information that I can give you this morning about those that are incarcerated, whether they're married or divorced, whether they are uh, uh, educated or uneducated, 
whether they've been in the military force or whether they're repeat offenders. But time won't allow that. So let me just look at 2020, 2021, 2020. In 2020, I'm dealing with the booking demographics, those who were arrested in 2020. In Vandenberg County, we arrested 7,352 in 2020. Out of that number, 5,237 were males. And out of that 5,237 males, 1,554 were African American. Now, I'm not talking about Latinos or Hispanic, I'm talking about black African Americans. These are the numbers that should frighten all of us and should, all, should call all of us to want to be more involved in this type of work. We had 47 19 year olds in prison, I mean in Vanderbilt County Jail in 2020. We had 49 20 year olds. We had 48 21 year olds. We had 48 22 year olds. And we had 53 23 year olds. Now, when you look at those numbers, 19 to 23, the thing that should come to your mind is that these are people who shouldn't even be in school. In school, in military, in college, or in graduate school, or at least in the workforce. The United States of America has 3,332,278,200 people in the United States of America. In the state of Indiana, the state of Indiana, is 6,785,528. In the city of Evansville, our population is about pretty close to 119,000. The actual figures are 118,952. Whites make up 75.3%. That's about 89,250 whites. Blacks make up 13.6, and those numbers kind of fluctuate, which is about 16,065. Asians make up 1.2%. That would be about 1,785 people. Blacks make up 12.1% and in some cases 13.4% of the total population of the United States of America. What are some of the reasons people go to jail? What are some of the reasons that we have in Vanderbilt County? That, well, we know drugs, we know domestic violence, we know robbery, homicide, Traffic violation, the one that always kills me is failure to appear. It's so simple. Just show up. Just show up and you don't have to bond out. Show up and you don't have to go. But when you are a transgressor, what is a transgressor? A transgressor is somebody who knows the boundaries and by an act of their own free will, they decide they're going to go over that boundary. Everybody doesn't have to go to jail. Our kids don't have to keep being incarcerated. It's just comes down to right. not going along with That's authoritative right. figures. In 2021, we're booking de demographics. In 2021, we had 7,947 total. Uh, male inmates, 5,514, and out of that number, 1,700 were African American. So we had an increase of 156 African Americans going to jail in 2021 than we did in 2020. Look at the numbers again with 19 year olds. 19 year olds were up two. We had 49 19 year olds in jail in 2021. We had 48 20 years old, up six. We had 52 21 year olds, down three. We had 57 22 year olds, up nine. And then we had 94 23 year olds, up 41. Mm -hmm. Last, 2022, booking demographics. 8,846 people came through Vandenberg County Jail. 6,200 of them were males, 1,877 were black. We had 87 19-year-olds. We had 49 20-year-olds. We had 50 22-year-olds, down seven and we had 72 23 year olds down 22. As I said before, those figures don't include Latinos and, Af and uh, Mexican American. But as you can see, the numbers are increasing. They are increasing. And if I could take just a moment and share with you some personal observations from experiences over the years of prison and jail ministry. One of the things that I have observed personally, and 
I've had the opportunity to be in every prison in the state of Indiana. I've worked with Chuck Holson, prison ministry. Many of you may know Chuck Holson, who went to prison for his part in the Watergate, special counsel for President Nixon. And in every one of those prisons, I find something that's really disturbing. And that is, most of these people in here don't have to be in prison. They bought a lie, they decided to do something illegal, which cost them more than what they had to pay. Yeah. <coughs> Our young kids are getting the information from a wrong source. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. And we may contribute to that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've observed is the number of people, especially young people, <coughs> they seem to feel comfortable in jail. Yeah. 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 Wow. Sheriff Robinson can verify this. I think we got about four or five juveniles. We have a couple in our jail for murder. This young is 16 years old. You know the tragedy in that, whenever I go back to see those kids, I don't hear, Chaplain Brown, can you call my mother? I don't hear Chaplain Brown, I'm scared to death. I don't want to be here. It's almost as if though, that six by nine cell is better than the home that they live in. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong by saying that these kids feel more comfortable in jail. I look on the floor and their commissary is stacked up this high. They're able to use a telephone. Me, I'd be crying bloody murder. Somebody call my mother, somebody call my dad, somebody give me some bond money. They don't complain, they just sit there as if though they don't have any value about human life. The other thing is, there's no remorse. That really troubles me. No matter what the case is, whether they robbed somebody, whether they killed somebody, whether they stole something, there is no remorse, which leads me to believe there's just no value on human life. You know I can count on my hand, actually, count on one hand, in 40 years, how many times I've heard the word, I'm sorry. I haven't heard it. Just no remorse whatsoever. And it makes me wonder about these kids' upbringing. What does this child, what does this young teenager really know about life? So you and I, in this type of work as mentoring, it takes us further than the school bus. It takes us further than the classrooms. It's more than borders and buses and limitations of where we can go and where we can't go. We're talking about lives. We're talking about lives of these young people who many have the ability of being doctors. They have the ability of being lawyers. They have the ability of excelling. Yeah. But if all you ever put before them is a video game, mm. if all they ever hear is about Tupac, mm. if they, all they ever hear is about uh, South Central, right. or Straight From Compton, yeah. I've even been asked that. Chaplain Brown, did you see Straight From Compton? I said, I see it every day. <laughs> I've never seen the movie. So we got a problem. And my statement to these young people, because as a minister, I'm committed to taking the one message it's more worth knowing, more worth having than any other message, which is the gospel. Amen. Because it makes you something that you never were. Amen. It makes you a new creation in Christ. That's it. That's it. I hope I won't be judged wrong for saying this, but there should be a strong, genuine concern for the condition of the African American youth in our community. And I have to add, for all the kids in our community. But I want to back up just a little bit because it's older men and women who produce children. Where does that put us? It starts in a place of authority. We got to talk about authority. We have given authority over to the music industry. Yes. We've given authority over to Netflix, I guess that's what you said. <laughs> We've given authority over to tr tr Twitter and Instagram right. and Facebook right. I, and commercials and our athletes. We begin to let our kids worship athletes just because they got a hundred million dollar contract. Right. And they couldn't spell cat if you gave them a C in the A. 
all of a sudden they become an authority on morality. You should be the first person your kids look at. You should be that role model. Most of us here know that authority has been given to us from God himself. Yeah. God instituted the family before he did the church. Yeah. I'm about finished. I was going to try to keep my 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes. <laughs> I've seen three generations in Vanderbilt County Jail. Mm. I've seen three generations in Vanderbilt County Jail. But that's not the sad part. The sad part, I saw three generations in there at the same time. Oh, wow. A gentleman I went to school with, he's passed on now. He was in the same housing unit with his son, and his grandson was about 20 yards away in another housing unit. You know what that tells me? Somebody dropped the ball. Yeah. Yeah. When you don't pass on to the previous generation what you've been through, your struggles, your defeats, your challenges, then this is what's going to happen. We are raising a generation of kids who are glued to some type of screen. Disrespectful. Some of the teachers can tell you. I've worked in alternative schools for over 20 years, even when it was down at, uh, not AIS, but it was. Krista McCullough, the other one I'm trying to think of. I'm just trying to Still, I can't even call him that. In the Reese, there you go, in the Reese, in the Reese. And even the youth care center before we had the youth care center, when it was down to the old rescue mission. It, it's, it's, teachers are fighting the tough battle. But three, three generations at one time, we have that authority. In 1950, you may have seen the stats. In 1950, the number one concern in the United States of America, and it was in this honor, family, health, the economy, and the war. 1950, that was the number one concern. Family. By 1990, family had went from here to here. In 40 years, family went from the top to the bottom, and it's 2023, and family is still at the bottom. The unit is messed up. We need men to step up the plate and do what they're supposed to do. And I think we'll all agree that the problem is all over this country. But with this group that's here today, not only the single group, but all of you who came out for this practice, today our focus is on Evansville, Indiana, where you live and where I live. So what should we do? What contribution can I make as an individual what contribution can we make collectively to eliminate this thing or at least put it in there? We have to keep in mind when we go about mentoring that we ought to encourage others. We ought to talk about it at the beauty shop, at the barber shop, on our job, wherever we work. <coughs> Scripture says where there's no vision, people perish. Are you ready to step up to the plate? Are you ready to support the plan you can? Are you ready to be a part of something that's going to be a difference maker? I'm always amazed. And I'll finish with this. That when David had to go fight the giant, everybody was complaining but the giant. <laughs> His brothers, what are you doing down there? You ought to be home taking care of the sheep. Yes. And David said these words, and I think we all ought to say them to ourselves. He said, is there not a cause? Yes. This giant is cussing us out. You're standing over here shaking in your boots. You see the drug trafficking. You see the shooting. But you're not doing anything. Is there not a cause? And if you don't want to step up to the plate, I will step up to the plate. I will step up to the plate and get done what needs to be done. How much further down this road are we going to go? It's not going to get any better. Shootings are going to keep going on. Drug dealing is going to keep going on. And I've heard the saying, Sheriff Robinson, Chief Billy Bowling, they can't do it by themselves. 
We need to step up to the plate. We need to start talking to our kids about what really matters. We know what type of child goes to school. And we know for a fact that sooner or later, if this kid doesn't get, get, get it right, and if we don't invest some quality time in it, that kid's going to end up in the jail. We don't have bathtubs in the jail. You take a shower. You don't get to pick your roommate. You may get me in there with any type of violent offender. When you stop and think about the Wabash Valley Correctional Facility with over 2,000 inmates, when you stop to think about Branchville with 1,600 inmates, when you stop to think about Pendleton, over 2,000 inmates, if you took all the inmates and in all the prisons that we have in the state of Indiana, it would not equal to what they have in Cook County Jail in Chicago. Wow. Mm -hmm. so Cook County Jail has got over 12,000 inmates in a county jail. The numbers are growing. They're getting bigger all the time. 13,000 police in Chicago, 100,000 gang members. Do the math. That's going to have to start at the grassroots. If we want to stop them from going to jail, maybe we need a curriculum superintendent in the school systems about the dangers of guns and weapons and drugs. It can't be just something that passed the jail. God bless you, thank you. Let us bow our heads. Let us bow our heads, almighty God. We see the giants in the land. And without you, they, they are too formidable a foe. Amen. We understand with you all things are possible. So we're leaning on you, dear God, to give us not only the insight, but the courage and the sense of urgency to be on the front line to address these issues before they get too far out of hand. Our communities are woefully wanting. Help us to be the solution to that problem. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. I want everybody to repeat after me these words. If not now, let's say it a little bit more vigor. If not now, if not now when? If not us, if not us. Who? who? Thank you for being here. I think we need a word, a word of hope right now. Uh, I'm going to ask at this time if um, our councilwoman, county councilwoman, uh, Stephanie Terry, if you would come and just say a few words to us. And I know it's kind of an off script kind of thing, uh, but we see solutions. Not just with SEMA, but we see solutions. Yes, right. As we look into this audience, yes. there are solutions here. Right. But we need to be able to come together and work as a unit to realize those solutions. Give us some hope. <laughs> <laughs> we need some hope. Oh, no, they got me up here with these uh, Baptist preachers. I'm, I'm in some good company, but thank you for number one, allow me to serve and represent you on the Denver County Council. Um, it is a privilege to be with you uh, this morning as a partner, as one of your partners in local government that cares about our young people. Uh, we know that our, our kids are faced with many challenges, depression, mental health, poverty, violence, substance abuse, social media addiction. We probably, some of us got that in here. Uh, and that's just the name of you. Um, and we've heard today clearly that there's still more work to be done in this community. So like many nonprofit organizations in our community, SEMA is prioritizing our youth through mentoring and tutoring, and more importantly, showing up for our kids. So that's why I was pretty proud. I wish it could have been more, but I didn't get invited to the check presentation, but I was glad to support $50,000 uh, for funding uh, for SEMA through the Vandenberg County Council for our American So make plans SEMA to come back for some more money. 
because it's there. It's there. The Bible tells us that faith without works is dead. And so I commend SEMA uh, for the work that you're doing to inspire and guide young lives so that they can reach their full potential. I had lunch with my, my mentee earlier this week, Ja'Kayla, over at Bossy. I've been with Ja'Kayla since, what, I think seventh, seventh grade. And um, I'm looking forward to Ja'Kayla graduating next year. Yeah. Yeah. I look forward to uh, the text that I get when she says, when you coming over? Where are we going, what are we going to eat? Because we don't just eat anything, we eat the good stuff. I, I, I go out of my way, I work downtown. She's over at Boston, but I go out of my way. I go all the way to the east side to make sure I get something good. Because it's just that important to invest in our young people. I think the more that we do, the more that we invest in the children and the families in this community, the stronger uh, they'll be. And the stronger our community will be as a whole. So will the men of SEMA stand up really quickly? Yeah. I think it's 50 plus men in SEMA. You don't see this very often. African American men investing in the community. Now will any educators that are in the room, social workers, counselors, will you stand, stay, keep standing, keep standing, keep standing. Educators, join SEMA. Will the faith leaders stand up? Will the mamas, the grandmamas, the aunties and uncles stand up? Did I get everybody? I just want to say thank you for all that you do. And keep pressing forward in faith. Thank you for those rays of hope. <laughs> Before we let you go, there are a few things that I want to do. Um, we've been talking about the children, save the children. I have a, an announcement I'd like to make. It is save the date, uh, promoting better health outcomes. We haven't even talked about nutrition or malnutrition. But there's an infant mortality summit that will be going on at the Old National Events Plaza Friday, February the 17th. Mark your calendar for that. From 9 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Keynote speaker is going to be Dr. Jerome Adams. Uh, we want you to be there. And to register, uh, there's information. Um, you can visit a certain website. This is this information is going to be made public. Uh, there's some on your tables, and we'll make sure there's more circulated. Uh, this uh, flyer will be out on the uh, one of the tables, and you can uh, make sure you get that. This is very important. A infant mortality summit. Also, I want to say that if this has blessed you in any way. If this has helped you to you know, stimulate your thinking as to how you could be involved in an endeavor that is bigger than all of us, uh, there are opportunities and ways in which you can do that. One of the things you can do is, uh, I hope that you have allowed us to capture your information so we can get back with you and give you updated information as to all the different events that are going to be going on throughout the calendar year. Uh, different. Um, Summits will be an outgrowth of this breakfast today. We want to make sure that we uh, continue to get the right people in the right place at the right time so we can come up with the right strategies. We may be able to uh, come alongside our children and give them the vital aid, assistance, and support that they so desperately need. We need you. As we said from the very, very outset, that we understand that the task is too daunting for one organization. We are not naive enough to think that SEMA can do all of this on our own. We need you, and you need us. We need each other to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish, to accomplish in our communities. So we're calling on you with that. Also, if you notice on your tables, and I know that many of you have seen these on your tables, it's a little envelope. 
Uh, yeah, um, the preacher in me is coming out. Uh, there's an envelope for you to pledge your monetary support if you so desire. It's not a mandatory thing. We just thought we'd just give you an opportunity, you know, to get blessed. You know, when you bless somebody, you open the door for your own blessings. You know that, right? So we are helping you to get a blessing. So go ahead and take these envelopes and do what you want to do with them. I'm not going to tell you what to do with them, but you know what they're for. Just govern yourself accordingly. <laughs> Amen. 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 I, I want to call uh, to give some, some, some remarks. I want to call uh, our uh, founder. This is the one who had the vision. Uh, our president. And he is the one who really drives this ship. Um, he uh, sails the ship, driving a whole different thing, huh. different mode of transportation. But I'm going to ask Ted McCurry if you'll come and give us some a closing remarks, and then afterwards I'll be here. Thank you. Ted McCurry. First of all, I want to thank all of you all for being here. Give yourself a big round of applause for being here. And as uh, Reverend Brooks said, uh, I would like my better half, Reverend Catherine McCreary, to raise her hand, and I'll be okay. <laughs> you know, uh, I, uh, tomorrow we will be celebrating uh, a great man and his vision and his dream that he had for this country. A giant of a man. Yes, sir. But this little man right here also had a dream. To see uh, how we could bring this community together. When I first um, thought about, I had retired at 16. And I was looking around, Reverend Brooks and I was playing golf at that time about once a week at least. And uh, I was telling him I saw what was going on in the community. This was uh, 2018, I think. And uh, he said, uh, what you mean? I said, I see all the problems that we have. You know, we got to do something about them. He said, go for it. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I <laughs> I, I first went to him and he gave me the wisdom to do what I'm doing here today. Then I went to talk about Ted because I know why Ted know everybody. <laughs> and uh, and talked to him and he told me some things that I needed to know, which was very important. Then I asked about five of my guys that I know friends to ask, uh, meet me at the African American Museum. Uh, remember that? Yes, sir. And uh, said that. Uh, Ask him, just meet me there, just talk about what we could do. And lo and behold, so many men showed up. We had to move it to the next meeting. <laughs> it was unbelievable, you know, but it was very pleasing to see men that want to serve. And very shortly, we, what we did, we met. And that's, I don't know whether you all are familiar, that's an organization called the 100 Black Men of America. They're nationwide, and uh, it's cost 4,000. $500 each year to be in that uh, organization. Uh, one of our members who is not here today, George Flowers, he said, look, we could, uh, that program you've been working on, we could use that program and we could uh, save that money for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how SEMA, Southern Indiana Mentoring Academy, came about because that's a program that I had been working on. I work with kids all my life. That's all I know. I don't know how to fix cars. I don't know how to do plumbing. I don't know how to do that. But I, I spent many, many years in the job cooperation, working for Job Corps. I uh, brother Bailey and a lot. Some of you all was there with me at that time, and uh, that's what I know to do. And so I said, we got to do something about these kids in Evansville. So that's how we decided this. That was. Uh, there's been several surveys. Uh, Tom Stratton is here today, he gave me one. Uh, where there's, uh, if, if, let me see, let me get this right. If a black boy had a black male teacher 
in the third, fourth, or fifth grade, they're most likely to graduate from high school. That doesn't exist here in Evansville and anywhere else. So that's the reason that I wanted to go into the grade schools initially. Uh, we got a program, we partnered with Memorial CDC, got a grant from the Wellman Foundation that we're getting ready to initiate this month, where we're gonna have, 20, we're working with uh, uh, Memorial CDC and Elite Tutoring, where we're gonna take all 25 of the kids that's in the uh, kindergarten, we're giving them a mentor and a tutor. When they move to the first grade, that mentor and tutor will move with them. When they move to the second grade, they'll move with them. When they move to the third grade, they'll move with them. Because our thought is that by the third grade, those kids will probably be reading on about the sixth or seventh grade level. That's one of the problems that we saw when we first went into the school system, it's a lot of kids can't read. It's a lot of kids can't read. But the initial thing that we looked at, and uh, Robert Bailey can attest to this, is that we wanted to tackle the absenteeism. Uh, Reverend Bailey has presented something to us, uh, Ms. Tolliver Wears and then, uh, Dr. Smith and others will be coming to you with this, but something that we can do, but. We're willing to go and work with Brother Bailey in the morning and get those kids. Wow. <laughs> if you're not there, you can't learn. I had a kid uh, in my sixth grade class, I won't call his name, last year, uh, where this kid I, I was in the classroom every Monday, and he wasn't there that Monday. And I, and I knew he had missed a couple of days before. And uh, so I said, what, where, is, uh, where, where is he? Uh, he's not here. So when he came back the next week, and I met with him, I said, oh, where you been, man? You know, you been here, we miss you. Well, I was at the mall. <laughs> like it didn't mean anything. That's just no big deal. I was at the mall. I was here. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. But this is the thinking of some of our young people, you know. And some of them have parent parental support, which is great. Some don't. There's a lot of dynamics of why the kids go from the school to prison. You know, and it's not just the parents' fault. There's some some things that are systemic that you know just been there. Yeah. You know. In our neighborhood, you know, so we're gonna have we're looking at trying to correct those things. Um, we have a garden program that we started at Lincoln. These third graders, I wish you could see them. <laughs> you know, they they starting early now trying to get their plants inside, get them going for this year. But to see so that they can see these things growing, coming up, they just amazed. You know, they want to do this stuff, you know. They have to, when are we going to do it, Mr. McCray? What are we going to do it? <laughs> you know, those, those, those are the enthusiasm that we get from the kids. Support. They need your support. Uh, we got a sign-up list out there. If you want to become a member of SEMA, you know, we can sign you up. Right. Somebody asks, uh, do you have to be black? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we take <laughs> we, we, we take we take all mentors, you know, that want to help these kids. And we're not, you know, we're, we're not talking about just having black kids. This is white kids, all our kids, all our kids in the school system. You know, so if you are interested, also uh, there's a table out there. You know, uh...